Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of Hometown Heroes. I'm Mike Kenichi, and um, it's kind of cool tonight because for one time only, I don't have to do the interview, and I actually get to be interviewed, and that's pretty cool. And uh, I have with me tonight a um, good friend and a uh, you know, fellow Derby Athletic Hall of Fame uh, committee member, Dan Shea, and he's going to interview me tonight, and I'm looking forward to it, and I know it's going to be a lot of fun. So, Dan, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Mike, thank you for allowing me to do it. Um, it's a long time coming. You um, you know, everybody who knows you knows what a great job you do interviewing coaches and players and teams. And, um, you know, it's approaching Thanksgiving. And I was thinking about, you know, every year I think about, you know, what am I grateful for? What am I thankful for? And, you know, you're one of the people I thought about, you know, I've been fortunate to be on your show several times and your podcast. And, um, and you do such a great job, not only with the Derby um, uh, community, but all, all the communities, whether it's Ansonia, Shelton Seymour, um, you even branched out um, to uh, some celebrities. And uh, it's it's really great what you've accomplished. And, uh, and this is just kind of, my way of, of, of giving back to you. Uh, like I said, you've done such a great job. Um, you're a great person. And I think it's time, uh, you know, to say thank you and, um, and celebrate you. I appreciate it. And, uh, that's very nice of you to say, and, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. Yeah, it's an honor. It really is. Um, like I said, I, I've been on your show, um, quite a few times, uh, with my 85 team and then with my pop Warner team. And, um, you know, uh, it's a lot of fun to reminisce. And um, so, again, uh, thanks for allowing me to do this. This is an absolute honor. Um, so my first question really is, is kind of, you know, how you got into um, doing all these uh, interviews and podcasts and, and whatnot. What what sparked you to start doing that? You know, it's funny. Um, we, we started getting into the early stages of the Derby Athletic Hall of Fame and you know, I was I I called different people to try to get some insight on how we should research and stuff like that. So uh, Laura McDomino, who uh, she was my teacher in school, and then mm -hmm. she came to a Hall of Fame meeting. And she yep. came just to see if she could give any assistance. And she got me in touch with a lady by the name of Liz Kennard, who worked at Comcast. So it was real cool because I'll tell you what, like for years, myself and I'm sure a bunch of people, we're trying to get a hold of the old cable 10 games, you know, mm. you never realize it back then, but God, you wish back then you recorded everything because those things were so invaluable, but mm -hmm. she got me in touch with Liz and Liz allowed me and uh, Sean Morse to uh, basically record every uh, Valley game from cable 10 onto DVD. And during that process, I met a lady by the name of uh, Melissa Leonard. And Liz suggested to Melissa Leonard that myself and Sean take her class. It's like a class you learn how to do all the controls in the studio. Oh, okay. You know, stuff like that. And Sean was really into that stuff. He really mm -hmm. likes the technical stuff. And, you know, he asked me would I take the class. And I said, yeah, it wouldn't be a problem. So after we had taken the class, you know, we took, I, I think we took about six weeks of it. Liz said to me, you know, why don't you do a show, something to do with Valley Sports? She goes, you seem to, like, really be into it. Why don't you do a show? So, you know, I thought about it, and, you know, I, I had Bill Pucci on as a trial run to just mm -hmm. to see how I would do. And, you know, it wasn't a great interview. You know, I was a little rusty, and I wasn't too good. But, uh, you know, little by little as time went on, I really started to enjoy doing them. You know, I think probably by like the third one, I really got into it, but that's really how it came about. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's great. I mean, you know, as kids, you know, our games were on Valley cable and uh, it was nice that uh, you had access to that. Um, I've been in the studio a few times and um, you know, it's quite a production and um, yeah. I don't, I don't think people realize the amount of work uh, that goes into it. It's more than just, you know, a few people sitting around the table talking, talk about some of the production stuff that has to go into that. Well, you know, I mean, the, especially like, you know, Dan, the, the big thing is, is I never realized the production that goes into how they did these cable 10 games. I mean, I talked to a guy by the name of Ron, uh, what was his last name, uh, Kurt Nutt or something like that. And he had told me 
that they gave up their Friday nights every night because he said they would get to the game that they were doing around five o'clock mm-hmm. to set up. They would record the game when the game started at seven. And then when the game ended, say nine fifteen, nine thirty, they would yep. go back to Comcast and edit everything. And he said their Friday nights were pretty much, you know, they had no Friday nights. They were doing these mm-hmm. games all the time. So right. it was pretty it was pretty amazing the production that went into that. And they would have Ed Clemens kind of come in and, you know, have him edit anything that he didn't like, you know, maybe something that was said that, you know, he probably wouldn't want in there. So, but the production part of it, as far as like the shows go, you know, when I'm doing them, I mean, you know, you have to set up, you have to have, you want the studio to look nice. So you try to set it up as best you can. So, you know, generally Sean and I would get there probably an hour and a half early before we, you know, do the show. You want to make sure the levels are right, you know, the white screen, all that stuff. And then, you know, the thing of it is, too, is once you do the show, the show, you know, is pretty much easy when you're interviewing people. But the big thing is afterwards, uh, you know, editing it and putting special features in. And sometimes that stuff could take three or four hours to do. So it's a it's a lot that goes into it for like a, you know, 45 minute to an hour show. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is this something that you've wanted to be do for wanted to do for as since a kid or? Um, like this kind of like journalism or when I was a kid, um, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I was a big, uh, Bob Costas and, uh, mm. which I'm call it, uh, Bill White fan. I enjoyed Bill White with the Yankees doing yep. games yep. and I enjoyed Bob Costas and I always wanted to do play by play. So I went to Connecticut school of broadcasting in, uh, 1997, you know, it was a great school and I learned a lot about radio, but unfortunately the TV part of it, they really didn't teach you as much. It was more oriented, orientated towards a uh, radio and they never really had a play by play class. So, you know, i went to Connecticut school of broadcast and um, I did some like internships at like W E L I, you know, radio towers yeah. park. Yeah. But uh, then I just kind of put it aside for a while. I just didn't think it was going to go anywhere, but it was always something in the back of my mind. And, but what really um, made me want, to start doing shows is I would just, you know, I would see different people interview people and, you know, sometimes I'd watch an interview and I'd see like, uh, you know, I, I'll give you a good example. You know, I, as you know, I had Don most on anytime I'd watched an interview with him, it was always disappointing that nobody ever asked him why he left happy days. I always wanted to know that. So yeah. I always felt like, you know, I could interview a person like a fan and yeah. you know ask questions that maybe i didn't get to hear but i really liked watching different interviews over the years like i loved watching um you know roy firestone you know yeah. things like that when they would do interviews mm-hmm. they were really good you know um even like uh and like bob costas like i said i mean when he did that you know uh i think it was up close with bob something like that with hbo he was tremendous with his interviews and i always enjoyed that and i that's when i really said you know i want to get into that part of it yeah um what i found amazing was uh, being in your studio is that what a lot of people i don't think realize is there's no you know takes it's you you we start the interview we start the show and it goes all the way through there's no stopping yeah. in between except for you you know you take that break and then uh, and then we pick up right again so there's no you know uh, take one, take two. It's just, it just rolls. And, um, I think your preparation probably is what keeps it so smooth. Um, you ever have times where you just get like, you know, was there ever a guest that was like really intimidating that made you nervous? Uh, you know, I, I don't know necessarily nervous per se. Uh, I was really nervous when I interviewed the hunt family only because there were so many of them and, I wanted to make sure I did the interview good for Jack. You know, it was a tribute to Jack. So I was nervous in that aspect. And I, I, I was nervous talking to Buddy Chernovitz because Buddy, as you know, he kind of doesn't mince his words. He kind of like <laughs> will say on the game yep. that was a terrible play. So, yep. you know, you always worry, are they like, you know, kind of analyzing you as you're doing the interview and stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say intimidated, but. Mm-hmm. I would probably tell you that 90% of the times I do shows, I'm always nervous, like going into it. Like, uh, 
you know, I, I interviewed Charlie Desenzo and he's the nicest guy in the world, but I was really nervous to interview him because you want to make sure that you do the interview good. And I always worried that I might mess up or I always worry about my openings and closings more than anything else. So I yeah. was a little nervous about that. I, I can appreciate it. Cause I, I, I was nervous all day about interviewing you and I really just wanted to be, you know, just two friends talking and, um, but you're right. It's about that opening. I was like, should I open? I, I kind of, I gave in. I let you do the open. <laughs> right. But it's, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it can be a little nerve wracking. So the question I have for you is, and I, I think I probably know the answer, but what was your, of all the, the shows that you did, the TV shows, what was your favorite interview? You know, I will tell you this, that the one I did with Charlie Desenzo is where I really felt confident that I could do this long term. And it was just such a great interview. And he made it easy because he just, yeah. you know, talked and he kind of reminisced. So I would definitely say that was the one where I said, you know, I'm getting really good at this. Yeah. Um, as far as my favorite one, you know, I mean, it, it's so hard because I, I'll be honest with you about this. I have yet to be disappointed in a guest. And that's not just when I would do the Valley Sports Rewinds uh, for the Sentinel. Those guests were there wasn't a bad guest there and the same thing here i mean there's so many what I, I don't really know if i could pick one i would just say the charlie one is what really kind of like got me it, it, i became more confident after that one yeah yeah i mean i can see that charlie's a great guy we all love him and uh um but i remember you had said that um after filming that one that you were worried that the the video footage had gotten lost uh I was so mad. <laughs> yeah. What happened was we had done part one, Sean and I, we edited it and we aired it, but part two was really the good interview. Like part one was good, but part two was more about his coaching career. Yeah. And right. it was just so good. I mean, you know, he broke down a couple of times, which, you know, I thought that added a lot to the interview. Like sure. that told me how real he was and then we're going to do it. And Sean couldn't find it anywhere. And we spent like five hours trying to find that thing. And then he talked to the lady at Comcast and she said, you know, there's no easy way to say this, but you're going to have to tell Mike it's gone. And I was just devastated yeah. because <laughs> I, Charlie agreed to redo the interview, but I said right. to myself, we're never going to capture that again. Yeah. And then what happened was Sean was editing his show and he was using Melissa Leonard's computer. Now, luckily he, saved it onto her computer and she yeah. saw a thing here she goes sean you know this says uh part two charlie descends do you know what this is and then sean clicked it and sure enough the interview yeah. was there right so right. thank god because i'm gonna yeah. tell you right now like that would have been that would have been tough to a tough pill to swallow that would have been hard for me yeah to get over that yeah because you know one i know um he, he got emotional when we were talking about the uh, when the river restaurant blew up. That yeah. was my my senior year, and he got emotional. So the 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 spontaneousness of that was you know would have been hard to reproduce, and that just brought out the genuineness of of Charlie. Yeah. Um, so and what what was interesting was about that was now that happened in eighty five. So you're talking thirty years later, right. and right. he was still emotional over yeah. it. So it's like you know it was a time in his life that was a painful time, and sure. you know when he talked about it. And I really thought that said a lot about him because I mean, 30 years later, he still got emotional about it. Yeah. 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 No, it definitely was, uh, was emotional and, uh, it was a great, great interview. You know, he, obviously he's one of my favorite, uh, people. So I was, I really love that one. Um, the one I thought you were going to say, as far as your favorite interview was with, um, mad dog, Chris Russo. Yeah. Um, how, did, how did that one come about? How did you get that? Well, I had been trying for two years. I've asked different people, you know, um, Joe Ferrigno had, I don't think Joe Ferrigno knew Mad Dog, but he knew somebody in New Canaan who oh. might be able to, you know, he might be able to talk to her or whatever, mm -hmm. but like, you know, he hadn't been able to get in touch with anybody, which, you know, I totally get. It's so hard to do. Sure. My, sure. my brother-in-law had, I think he, I'm trying to think his coworker knew Mad Dog's wife, something like that. But, you know, no luck. And what really happened was um, I had wanted to do one with him and his son, Tim, because I figured everybody's done an interview about Mad Dog's career. I thought it'd be real. And I kind of followed Tim a little bit when he played at New Canaan. I'd listen to Mad Dog's yeah. shows. 
and he would have Tim right. on the show sometimes. Yep. So I said, that'd be pretty cool to do. And I just, I talked to different people. I talked to New Canaan, like the guy from New Canaan's Parks and Rec. I talked to, you know, the athletic director at New Canaan. And, you know, I had talked to them and like, that was probably like three or four months prior. And then I got an email one day from, I think the Parks and Rec guy. And he said, Mike, um, I found out that Tim Russo's on Facebook. He said, if you message him, he will respond to it. He sounds interested. So I did. And he responded to me in five seconds. And, well, you know, he said, you know, hopefully my dad will, you know, be on board with it. I'll let you know. And then a few months went by because he was still in school. So I didn't okay. push it. I waited till school ended. Then I asked him again and he goes, I talked to my dad and he said he'd love to do it. Just let me know when a good date is. And I right. kid you not, though, I... <laughs> Probably once a week, I would ask him, you know, how's this date? I always wanted to keep it fresh in his head. And when he sent me a text and he said, my father and I both agreed that August 5th, on Monday, August 5th, will be a good day to do the interview. Uh, is that cool? And I said, absolutely. But I'm going to tell you, until I saw him walk into the building, I wasn't going to yeah. believe that it was really yeah. him. Yeah. So, But that that's how it all came about. And, it, you know, it was just awesome because... He was really the one guy I wanted to interview, you know, because I've always liked his talk shows and doing an interview show. I wanted to be able to interview him. So I was really glad that happened. Yeah, that, that was a great interview. Um, you know, every every night I listened to Mike and the Mad Dog on the way home. And uh, yeah. so it was a thrill for me to listen to that. Um, and Mad Dog, you know, he's 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 a, uh, he's a character. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, he was he seemed to be very welcoming to you and uh which is nice. You know, he's trying to yeah. give somebody else a, a, a shot and just like he appreciated the fans. That's what it told me that he yeah. appreciated the fans because he never once said to me that night, we got to be out of here at a certain time. He never said that oh, once. Right. I mean, he kept talking a lot. If you listen to it, he, he was really like into, you know, talking about Tim and then talking about his career. So, yeah. you know, that made it easy as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now like, Due to, um, I'm guessing due to you know COVID and stuff, a lot of the your your studio access has been limited, um, and it seems like you've done a lot of um, more of these type of interviews through podcasts. Um, do you prefer one or 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 the other? I mean, I like the studio because you're one on one with the person, mm -hmm. and you know you're talking to them. But unfortunately, Comcast. I heard in January they're going to reopen the studio, but they haven't reopened the studio. So right. it was either I do this or my shows were just never going to, you know, we were never going to be able to resume them. And Melissa is the one who uh, talked me into doing this. She got me, you know, linked with this uh, program, which is great, StreamYard. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to resume. And I'll tell you what, it, it works out a lot, though, because I could interview somebody like a former valley athlete who lives in like michigan or lives in uh virginia as you know john tilkey he lives in virginia right. you right. know we were able to have him on where i would never be able to have him on otherwise so that right. part of it is really awesome yeah and it's got to be easier too right i mean you're still oh, have yeah. to prep with your, you know as far as uh production you just basically hit record a little music yeah. in the background and, and off you go right yeah. I mean, it's easy. I mean, and again, we still, you know, I still edit them. I have a nice, you know, a real good producer, Michael Jones, who I think he isn't even 17 years old yet. And I mean, he has edited a bunch of my shows lately. And I mean, he just does a terrific job and, you know, nothing's changed other than we're not in the studio. Otherwise, you know, everything's been, you know, the same and, you know, I'm happy about that. Like, you know, the Kevin Sharkey one, I thought Michael did a great job putting that together. And, uh, mm. you know, it, it, that's what makes it really rewarding. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that it's um, there are people behind the scenes that, that are helping you. And um, and it's great. I mean, being able to produce something like this, it, it's awesome. What um, if you had to pick one person, what would your dream interview be? Uh, Don Maddenly. I am a big <laughs> Yankees fan and. When I was a kid, the Yankees, you know, they'd always come close, but they would never get there. Right. You know, they never had pitching. But, I mean, he was the guy, man. Every time he came up, the crowd went crazy. 
-hmm. you know, he was very intimidated and he had that swing and, you know, he was the guy I loved as a kid. I mean, that's why I played baseball because I loved him. You know, it would either be him, Dan Marino or Larry Bird. Those are my three favorite athletes. Okay. So, you know. I, I thought for sure, you, I thought you were going to say Jeter, but uh, I knew it was going to uh, be a I like, Listen, <laughs> I love Jeter, and if I had yeah. the opportunity, absolutely. Yeah, sure. But I would probably say those three, if I could get one of those three, that would be awesome. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, as a Red Sox fan, I always loved Mattingly swing. That, that left-handed yeah. swing that he had was just a thing of beauty, you know? Yeah. Um, and as a Yankee fan, I love Jim Rice's swing. I mean, that's a guy yeah. I love to interview, too, you know, is Jim yeah. Rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Hopefully someday you'll get that. You never yeah, know. No. <laughs> you got Mad Dog. You got you maybe uh he can hook you up with some uh well he doesn't like the Yankees, so he might not <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> true. I know. He hates yeah. the Yankees. Um yeah. you know, I was looking too, I mean I don't know if you realize, like if you look at your um uh, the shows that you've done in studio plus these podcasts, I mean it's almost a hundred interviews that you've done. I mean, yeah. that that says a lot, Mike. I mean, because like I said, it's it's not um, – there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. And um, to do that many, I mean, just – it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it's hard to believe that it's been that many. But, you know, and the thing I like about it the most is, is it's – I get to interview people that – I watched as a kid, you know, I was big into derby, you know, sports when I was a kid, especially derby football and, sure. you know, guys that you really idolized when you were a kid that you never really knew, you know, mm -hmm. some of the guys like I never met John Bogart till I interviewed him. I never okay. really ha had met him, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Kevin Sharkey, same thing. I talked to Kevin, you know, here and there, but I never really got to meet him. So you kind of get to talk to these people. And when you get to reminisce about their careers, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely is, uh, is, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, um, and, and what did you do first? Did you do the Valley sports, uh, rewind that was that your first thing or was it no, the, the, the show? It, it was the hometown heroes. And then okay. what happened was Eugene, um, Drisco was looking mm -hmm. to do something with, Valley sports in some capacity. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think Jen Moffitt told him to get in touch with me. I think she, I have to give her the credit cause, um, I think she told him he, he was, he kind of threw it out there on Facebook and then she had told him contact, uh, you know, Mike Nietzsche. And then mm -hmm. he did. And, you know, I met with him for literally 10 minutes and he said, would you be open to doing like a weekly interview show? And I said, yeah, you know, it should be fun. We'll see what happens. And again, it was all trial and error, but uh, I really enjoyed doing those a lot too because mm -hmm. the camera wasn't on you. And like mm. when the camera's on you, sometimes you get nervous. Yep. But when there's no camera on you, you could just kind of have a conversation. And I, I, I really enjoyed doing those a lot. Yeah, I know. I remember having to go to the uh, Valley Independent uh, station that time with you. And, um, and you're right, you put the headphones on, and it was just you and I talking. You know, yeah, no, no yeah. pressure of the camera, and uh, it really was just having a conversation. And I, I kind of feel like the same way now. I mean, we're just sitting here talking. And uh, right. but yeah, when you put the camera on, um, I remember being in the studio with uh, with John Bogart, and then with the kids from a '95 uh, team. It's a little different yeah. when you got the camera on you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and you know that '90 90, that '95 team was that was enjoyable too because I always looked at that team as. Derby needed that. They needed that in that time because their varsity program had taken, you know, had a couple of real bad years. And, mm -hmm. you know, that I'll never forget that weekend. I think it was, you know, Thanksgiving weekend. They won that big game, I think, against San Sonia on right. a Saturday. Yeah. And, you know, just seeing like the whole town, everybody's beeping on the highway and stuff. That was really cool. And, you know, I always wanted to kind of talk to some of those players from that team because, I mean, that was a great time in Derby. It really was. Yeah, it really was. And it, you know, when I, when I think back about it, you know, it's great memories with the team, but one of the things I remember most about it is the, is just the, the town and how, just how fortunate we are to live in a small town like Derby or like, or like the, the Valley, because even the, the Valley teams, they supported us. And yeah. um, is, we're very fortunate to live in, in, uh, in this area. Um, I said uh, people that, you know, come out of the woodwork to support 
um, the teams, the kids, and different causes and, and things like that. It's it's incredible, and um, I, I feel you know not only from the '85 team or the, my '95 team and all the years I've coached, but um, that's why I just felt you know feel so good about doing that and and giving back because I can never put a price on what it's done for me. Right. And, um, and I, so that's why I think about what you do. And I, I just, I said, you know, we got to do something for you um, to, to celebrate you and, and all you do, because again, it's for being on your show a few times, I know, I see how much uh, work goes on. And I know you, one time you had, uh, you and Sean invited me to his house and I saw the equipment and I was like, wow, yeah. the, the amount of work that goes into that was, I was like, wow. I mean, when I did my videotapes um, for the teams, I had two cassette decks, two uh, two yeah. VCRs and a cassette deck. And Sean had all kinds of uh, equipment there, and uh, it was it was quite intimidating. But it just shows that you know how much work it goes into, and it takes a long time too. Yeah, uh, it's not just. Know? I mean, sometimes it could take five to ten minutes to put just one pick or one article into a thing. Right. So you know you you have to know going in when you edit that you're going to be there for a while and you know, it's going to, yeah. it, it, it's tedious. Yeah. I think, I think when uh, John Bogart and I did the interview, I think um, we might've done the interview in April and didn't get to watch it until like October. Like it took five, six months. Right. I mean, it, it took yeah. a long time. You know, I think back then, you know, if I had to do it all over again now, I would have done things a little differently in that part. I was kind of mm -hmm. booking interviews in advance you know, yeah. and, you know, recording them early. And sometimes I didn't show an interview till a year later, you know, looking back, I, I wouldn't book any in advance like that anymore. I would just try to do it once a month yeah. so that, you know, that thing's played right away. Cause it, it did take a little longer than I, you know, I wanted to get them done sooner, but it just wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, realistic. Yeah. What I, what I found enjoyable about it was I really forgot about what we, we talked about or what we said. So it was all kind of new then. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great time. Um, I have been fortunate to be with you on the uh, Hall of Fame committee. So I, I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, I think that we started that around um, 2015. Um, yeah, we met in the summer of 14. Yeah. Yep, yep. So for those who people don't know, Mike is the president of the Derby um, F High School Athletic Hall of Fame. Um, so, Mike, just talk a little bit about that. I mean, how, how that came about. Well, you know, I'll give you a good example of how it got into my head to do it. Number one, I talked to Jack Hunt. Um, I got to know Jack around 2008 very well. And he was trying to resurrect the Ansonia Sports Hall of Fame when Pop Shortle died. Right. They never took it over again. It was just kind of, you know, abandoned. And we were talking a lot. And he had said to me, you know, you, you should try to get some people involved and start a Derby Hall of Fame. But I really didn't take it too seriously. But he had kind of pushed for me to do that. And then if I didn't see him for like a couple months, every time I saw him, he said, did you get that thing started yet? And I said, I'm working on it. But I, I, I don't think I really was. But what really made me want to get it started was – it was like a game in – it was a Derby Shelton football game. I want to say maybe 2013. And I heard them say, we're going to recognize the players from the 70s and the 80s teams, which I thought was cool. Yep. But all they did was they said, if you played in the 70s, stand up. If you played in the 80s, stand up. And I said to myself, you know, that's yeah. not really recognizing, right. yeah. you know, great players. So right. I said right. to myself, nobody – these kids today don't know anything about – derby sports the tradition the past everything and that's really it was after that game i said you know what we have to do something because there it looks like this thing's dying you know yeah um yeah it's um i think we have what five classes in now that we've inducted yeah 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 so and, uh go ahead i'm sorry no and i was just gonna say i mean you know i i think you know we've we've done it right in the sense that we've never rushed it. We've never forced it. And, uh, you know, I think what's really cool about it is like, um, and I remember this one time I, I said this to myself, um, you and I are usually always on the same page. And then there was one time we had a disagreement about inducting a certain person. And I remember thinking afterwards, you know, 
I hope there's no hard feelings. But then I thought about it. I go, you know what? If we agree all the time, then it's not going to work. We have to have mm -hmm. that, you know, we're, we're not always going to be on the same page. And I really thought that was cool because it showed that, you know, every committee member could disagree on something. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the goal is still to pick a good class. And I think, you know, the 10 committee members on this committee have done a great job doing that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think people sometimes don't understand how much work goes into it and and pressure, too. You know, yeah. Um, a lot of times when I see people out, they'll mention the Hall of Fame and um, and they'll 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 voice their opinions of people who were inducted who maybe they thought shouldn't be or people who have not been elected who should be. And um, so it can be tough, you know, and um, but I think what um, people need to understand is how much work really, really goes into it. And I think you're right. I think the committee members we have are are fantastic. We have a whole bunch of different generations. Yeah, I love hearing um, Bob and Walt and, and Fran uh, uh, talk about, you know, guys from the, the, their generation who we've heard of. Yeah, but they, they can, you know, they could, um, you know, add a little more insight to that. And that's what I've enjoyed m the most is learning about some of these um, people through, yeah. through the years, you know. And, you know, the thing of it is, is a lot of times we get a little off track and we we talk about a certain yeah. athlete and then yeah. it brings us to a game or something and we just start talking about that. But I think that's the fun part of it because it doesn't always have to be business all the time. You know, yeah. it's a lot of fun. And, you know, you bring up Wall and Fran and what always makes me laugh is both of them were, you know, and they were players at the same time. You know, they grew up in the same time and they both have different recollections of games and athletes and stuff so like that's pretty cool because fran sees it one way and walt might see it a different way and i think that's really cool because they both have a different perspective of how it went down yeah i mean like i said i've um from my perspective and a lot of the younger guys you know we've heard of john pagliaro but we didn't but see him I, we didn't see him play you know we've heard of vinnie greco and brent sanford and those guys those guys for us were were legends and but we didn't see them play, but they saw them play, and I, I think some of them even played with them. Yeah. And, um, so getting their perspective um, is, is really awesome, and um, you know, so hopefully that that continues. Uh, it's a great thing, and uh, um, give us an update, uh, up, give people an update about where we stand and and what's going to happen next. Well, you know, we are going to meet the entire month of december and we hope by like you know before christmas we have the next class picked and then we will i mean we'll get it done and uh you know i would say we'll pick that class and i would probably say we will try to have the banquet either april or may you know we had it last year in the summer which was weird because we had never done that before mm -hmm. but we had a great turnout i mean it really was and that was the thing too with covid that poor you know that that yeah. fifth class waited two years to finally get yeah. their induction thing right but um you know i really applaud the committee and i applaud the people that helped us out to have that banquet you know and get it done because those guys really deserve to be recognized and um you know i i could assure you that the new class will be picked before the new year yeah i'm looking forward to it um i i miss having all those discussions and uh yeah, you know, COVID really, it, it really yeah. screwed a lot of things up because, you know, now everybody kind of has to get back into the group. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you think about some of the um, the people that have been inducted, has um, there has there been anyone in particular that's really impacted you um, that um, when you when you made those that call to let them know that they were inducted? You know, um, <laughs> Frank Ishman was cool because. When I called him, I said, did you play? For, I said, did you go to Derby High School in, you know, 1961, whatever it was? And he said, yeah. And, I, you know, and I said, well, I, I want to congratulate you. You're in the Hall of Fame. And he said, oh, really? He goes, I didn't think I was relevant anymore. You know, and that was pretty cool how he said that. Um, I, there was there was a couple who were really touched by it. I think the one that we all did when we all called Charlie DeCenzo together. Mm -hmm. You could see he was kind of choked up about that. You know, yeah. that that was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, Billy Thompson was really cool to uh, call because Billy Thompson thought I was a telemarketer. And, you know, 
But yeah, I mean, they all seem to, most of them that you call, they all seem very appreciative and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, really happy. You know, even Joe Bonanto, like, you know, I remember telling him, I, I saw him, I knew he hung out at Dutch's. So I remember <laughs> going to Dutch's yep. and I brought a Hall of Fame hat in and I said, could you uh, try this on for me? And he said, why me? And I go, well, you know, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame in a couple months. And, you know, that was really cool. Because yeah. Joe was always so long associated with Shelton and people sure. forget that he was a Derby high graduate and a very good athlete. So I thought that was cool because we kind of brought him back to Derby, which, you know, yeah. I thought that was really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, like I said, it, it's, um, it's a tough process. I mean, the, the first couple of classes were pretty much no brainers, but now it's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of research, but it has been fun, you know, for me personally, yeah. just meeting, meeting some of these guys. Um, like I said, like a, like a Vin Greco, um, I said, growing up, he was a, a legend for us, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and just meeting him. Uh, I remember the first time I met him, it was, I was like, you're Vinnie Greco from Derby. And I was yeah. like, I was like, you know, starstruck. Um, and, and I you know, I, it's funny you bring that up. I don't mean to cut you off, but mm-hmm. anytime I go over his house, he has a thing printed out in a frame of a Facebook article you did on him a few years back. It does. And, and yeah, and it sits right on his counter in a frame. So like that must have made an impression on him because it sits right there. So, I mean, I always thought that was really cool that like, you know, you were just writing something about, you know, former Derby athletes and, you know, mm-hmm. he saw it and he was really moved by it. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, um, like I said, I was, I was starstruck. I really was. Um, I mean, he had this medium length leather jacket, white t-shirt. He was like the, looked like the Fonz. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, but I, you know, and I'm talking to him and, and he saw, uh, something on my credenza about coaching and he goes, Oh, you, you coach. And I said, yeah. And so he started talking about me and I'm like, I should be talking about you. <laughs> right. And, uh, he was just such a great guy, very personable. And, uh, it was, uh, it was great you know, to meet him then and then yeah. get to induct him in the hall of fame. And you know what's cool about him is he has really like been appreciative that this Hall of Fame got started. I mean, he is very big on, you know, that we haven't really got criticized too much. Everybody's been very supportive, but there are the occasional ones. And, you know, he doesn't want it. He won't stand for it if he hears somebody bad mouthing us. He, you know, he'll back us up all the time. And that's pretty cool that like, you know, he really appreciates being an inductee and, you know, that we put the work in and, you know, that, that's what's really cool about it as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. There are so many people that are deserving and they are hall of fame athletes. They just might not be just yet. Um, yeah. and, um, it is, it is tough because you know, they get disappointed and, uh, that's what we, we have a tough job to do. And, uh, you know, but in, in the end it, it's worth it. You know, um, yeah. I remember, I remember I, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to call Bobby Orchano and letting him know. And, uh, right. I mean, he, he, his reaction, he, he almost had me in tears. Um, cause he has, he's had a million knee surgeries and he says, boy, yeah. you know, he goes, looks like all those surgeries, it was worth it after all. And I got choked up. I was like, wow. I mean, like it really meant a lot to him. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and Bobby was somebody, obviously I grew up known because of, uh, Mark, uh, being uh, classmates with Mark. Yeah. Li- living up the street from him. And, um, so that, that was great. Um, and then, uh, uh, then I, I had, a, I called Tony Bazander and who, who lived in Canada. Yeah. And I remember yeah. leaving the message on his thing saying that I was calling from Derby high school and that it wasn't a scam. I said, please call me back. <laughs> and, uh, so finally he, uh, I got in touch with his secretaries and he finally called me back and, uh, and he, and he was great. And he's actually a cousin of mine. And, right. Um, so, uh, so that was a thrill. And, um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting back to, uh, uh, you know, get ready to pick class number six. Yeah. I mean, it's really fun. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, at the end of the day, I know that, you know, any bad, and there's hardly any bad, but any bad, the good outweighs it by far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you just see the um, the other thing is like that I that I, I loved is some of the reunions we created. You know, we had that the, with the class of fifty one basketball team. Yeah, we got, we got those guys back together, and uh, and then different classmates um, and people that come out for 
I think I think Kenny Pereira's had three tables, right? Yeah. Of people that came there to support yeah. him, right? And um, so well, it's, look it's what just... we went look what we went through that second class. We had to change the venue because we ran out of room because right. the demand was so there. And I mean, you yeah. know, we were all stressed about that, and it ended up being a great event. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was terrific. Uh, it was uh, it was a great venue. Um, the the uh, the gym was decorated it was it was incredible and that's the other thing too the support that we're getting from the from the town as yeah. well is is well, really yeah. incredible Mar marty pasquale and uh rachel uh Artis, I'm, i know her name's different now but i can't pronounce it but <laughs> those two really supported us in the beginning like nobody else i mean they helped us so much and i can never thank them enough because they were really supportive yeah and that's the thing, you know, people don't, again, don't realize how much work goes into to that, um, into the Hall of Fame, you know, and putting together the banquets. Um, anybody that's ever put together a banquet knows how challenging it is. But for yeah. you, you know, having to get, you know, a lot of our inductees are, come from out of state. So coordinating them in and, and tables and, and all kinds of stuff, it's it's it's, it's challenging. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but um, – you and then you know, Jen, you guys do a great job, and um, I look forward. I wasn't able to go to this last one, but I, I look forward to it every year. Um, just get to meet so many people. Um, oh yeah, you and know. you know, you always have people talking and reminiscing, and it it just goes to show that these Derby people are still out there. They haven't disappeared. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and um, you know, we're fortunate too. I I, I think we talked about it. Um, the other day when you had us on with Charlie is that, you know, we, we grew up in an incredible, you know, in the mid eighties in an era where, you know um, you know, you go to the games and there's 10,000 people at the games, you know, and it wasn't just football. You go to a basketball game or wrestle and the gym was filled. Yeah. And, you know, we had, um, you know, uh, sports were covered in every newspaper. We had our own Valley newspaper with the evening Sentinel. Yeah. Um, you know, writers like, like Bill Pucci, who covered the Valley, um, Valley Cable, who put our football games on TV, you yeah, know, which and, was and, tremendous. Oh, yeah. and you're right about the, I remember the, the production that would go into them. There'd be, you know, six or seven cameramen and the guys in the truck and so yeah. much that went into that and all, all that stuff is, is pretty much gone now. Yeah. And, which um, is sad. You know, yeah. And, and again, that's what makes me even more appreciative of somebody like yourself who, you know, you're helping to, to not only keep this stuff alive, but you, you put on, like, I know you put on uh, Tommy Abel Jr. And you put in on um, Mike, um, Mike, um, Mike, uh, Michael Hyder's kid. And um, he had. Uh, um, yes, he's so yeah. yes, yes. You know, you're getting those kids in there. And so. Um, the fact that you're you're still doing this and keeping those things alive is is, is so important, um, and because uh, all that other stuff is not there anymore. No, it's not. And you know, I mean, it's it. You know, it is upsetting because I really believe too. That's what's really hurt. You know, when you don't see people go to the games anymore, I think a lot of it is is because there's no coverage anymore, and people also know they could stream everything online. So they don't have to, you know, drive out to Ansonia or drive out to Derby, wherever they might go. I mean, there was a time that if Derby played Cheshire on a Friday night in Cheshire, everybody that was a Derby football fan went to that game. It didn't matter the ride. It didn't matter at all. Now you can't even get people to go to their own home games, which is, you know, it's disappointing. Yeah. I always remember, um, I think it was Pop Shortle uh, used to say that uh, the only – game he ever missed was his wedding day yeah right so yeah. um and, and again it wasn't just football too like you go to the basketball games and derby you know didn't always have the greatest basketball team but the gym was always filled the wrestling yeah. team the, the gym was all, always filled and um and and the coverage too like i said about the you know being fortunate of having the um the evening sentinel and then the valley gazette you know those those articles um were front page sometimes yeah now yeah. The, the teams you know you, you got to dig deep to find articles on you know some of the games it's just not covered the way it used to be no i mean and that sentinel was awesome and 
we'll never see anything like that again. Yeah, no, I doubt it. And um, that's why I enjoy listening to, um, when I, you know, when I think of you, I think of people like, like Coach DeMeo, who's, you know, just really into high school sports, not just football, but he does basketball and he does hockey. Um, yeah. I think he does girls softball too. You know, um, we need people like that. We need people like you um, to help, you know, keep, keep this stuff alive. So, you know, has like me can always have a forum to, <laughs> to get on, you know, it's, right. um, you know, we laugh and, and everything, but you know, it, it's fun to, um, it's an honor, first of all, to be on, on your show, um, to be able to, to reminisce, um, and, and bring back just some great memories. Yeah. And that's ultimately what the goal is, is, you know, just, it's like two guys, you know, if I have like four guys on, it's five guys having a conversation, you know, at a coffee shop, you know, I thought the one we did a couple of weeks ago, I mean, that was one of my favorite interviews because I really didn't have to talk a lot. You know, those yeah. guys kind of reminisced, you know, like, you know, and Desenzo being there with them. And I, and I thought that was important, too, because I felt like it was like a reunion of sorts with the players and their coach. And I, I just really thought that was one of the better interviews. And, you know, I when I have a guy like Joe Mazzanti, who, you know, He's known for running when he's sending me a text and saying he enjoyed, you know, those players on with Charlie. I mean, that just, mm -hmm. you know, that that's what makes it all worth it when you get people like that, you know, that are saying that. Yeah. And um, and actually, I, I really think that's that's one of the first times that we've talked about that game with Charlie in, in a long, long time. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about years. And uh, so, like I said, it was. um you know, it was just a bunch of guys sitting around the table talking, and that's just what it was. And um, it, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, um, again, it was just one of the reasons why I, I was hoping to be able to do this with you today. And and really just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much um, for keeping Valley Sports alive and recognizing the coaches and the kids that, you know, they put in so much time and they work so hard and again there's the coverage isn't there and um i'm just very grateful that we have somebody like you to help you know keep this going well, i do appreciate that i really do and i i thank you for that that's very nice uh, you're welcome mike so i guess that's gonna do it um mike again thanks for letting me uh to do this with you today um again uh just a terrific job and uh and and keep it up um a lot of us enjoy i watch almost every one of your podcasts and your hometown heroes you, um they're on they're all on youtube and um uh, i look forward to um any surprises that you got coming up um it would you know, be surprised uh, if you told us i guess <laughs> yeah i mean nothing that stands out yet i mean uh i do think I could tell you one that's going to happen is we are going to, I'm going to sit down with the 1983 Ansonia team, you know, their captains and a few of the other players. Cause that was a great team for Ansonia. They were number one in the state. So yeah. that's probably going to happen if not next week, the week after. So that, that'll be a real cool interview. Uh, yep. You know, you, I mean, I'm still always trying to find different athletes out there, you know, trying to track them down different coaches, you know, I still want to get Jack Cochran on. I've been working on that forever. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's still a long way, you know, there's still a lot to do. I still have, you know, there's so many more I want to interview. So, you know, I hope yep. that, you know, we're able to uh, accomplish that and, you know, get that done. Well, I'll be watching. I appreciate it, Mike. Well, I thank you. And uh, thank you for doing this tonight. That was very nice of you. All right, Mike. You Thanks, have a good have a good Thanksgiving. You as well, buddy. Um, and, you know, okay. tell the family I said hello. Thanks, I will. Bud. Thank you. All right. Take care.